you like this if you don't have it. Okay. I think we got it. Appreciate it, guys. Rusty, Danny, you get the gold stars. Appreciate it a bunch. And by the closing of the curtain, that means our class is about to start. We want to say welcome to everybody. We appreciate you so much. Uh, we do want to get any comments or questions on the uh, live feed for our Facebook and YouTube audience. So if you do have a question or a comment or whatever, uh, please text it to me. You already have my phone number, so uh, please do that and I'd be glad to add it to the list. Now, uh, let me give you a little preview. Uh, what's happening after we finish the final week? After we finish the final week, we will wrap up in the book of Acts the greatest stories and events of the Bible. That will take us another 30 or so more lessons. Once we finish that, Several of you have asked to do the book of Revelation. I've got something better. In fact, I think it's perhaps the best lesson series I've ever written, uh, in my opinion. We're going to do that. But don't worry. I'm going to give you Revelation as a sermon series. Today we wrap up the sermon series on Mark. We started way back in November of last year, and we're going to wrap up Mark today. So my next time to speak, which will be the 25th of July, we're going to start a sermon series on the book of Revelation. So it's going to be quite interesting. It's going to be 22 sermons out of the book of Revelation, and it's going to be very interesting. I'm kind of wondering, what am I going to say about the book of Revelation? We'll find out after we start the sermon series. But in the meantime, we need to actually finish up the greatest stories. Greatest stories will take us all the way through the book of Acts. Uh, I want to point out a few things here. This right here is another map I found online uh, for the city of Jerusalem. I might remind you, okay, we got the Mount of Olives. We got three mountaintops uh, pretty much running north and south. The only one that we're really interested in is the Mount of Olives. Uh, Jesus will be staying in Bethany part of this time. That's where the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Also the home of Simon the leper. He will be traveling over to Jerusalem and he'll be operating here in the court of the Gentiles, this outer area outside the proper temple itself. These other places here are our best guesses on where they were located. We have uh, Herod's palace, uh, which will uh, serve as the praetorium where Pilate uh, will... Uh, do the Roman trial there. Uh, Herod Antipas over at the Hasmonean Palace. Uh, we have a couple of possible sites of where Golgotha actually was. We don't know for sure, but notice both sites are outside the city wall as required. <clears throat> and also both sites are by major roads, major gates going into the city. Here right here is this gate. We've got another gate right here. So these two sites would uh, certainly be in a very high traffic area. And the Romans loved to have crucifixions in high traffic areas because they want to get the most bang out of their buck. The most bang is the most fear, the most dread, the most horror. And uh, having it there uh, near a uh, high traffic area would certainly take care of that. Now we're up to story number 147. Here's a model. Here's a model of the city of Jerusalem. And uh, if you'll notice, these are two people. You kind of get an idea of the size of this model. Very, uh, very large model of the city of Jerusalem. We're up to story number 147 and also story number 148. 
We're going into the city of Jerusalem here on this Tuesday. Tuesday. We think A.D. 30. This is Tuesday, April the 4th. Now, we've already read Matthew chapter 21. Let's look at Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Let's begin in Mark chapter 11. Let's begin with verse number 20. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now why did they not see that fig tree before on Monday evening? Well, possibility here. There is two roads to Jerusalem from Bethany. This one climbs the Mount of Olives. This one, which is not on the map, actually goes around the Mount of Olives. So maybe they took one of the other roads back home on Monday evening. Maybe it was too dark to see what was happening. But for whatever reason, they don't notice the tree on Monday evening. They notice it on Tuesday morning. Peter, remembering, he remembers what happened. You know, this is a very unique miracle because this is Jesus' only negative miracle where he does something that hurts something. He hurt the tree. He killed the tree. But he killed the tree for a reason. Peter said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Jesus answered and said to them, Okay, here comes the lesson. Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, what mountain? Well, I would say probably either the Mount of Olives. He's probably saying, if you say to this mountain, or maybe he's talking about Mount Zion, okay, or the city of Jerusalem. If you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt. Other words, if you think it's going to rain, grab your umbrella. Have faith. Don't doubt. And does not doubt in his heart, but believes that these things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, now we got another lesson on prayer here. Whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses trespasses. The unstated lesson from the fig tree is, of course, about the faithless religious leaders. Uh, go with me for just a moment. This will just take just a moment. Hosea chapter 9. Hosea chapter 9. Let's look at verse 10. I found Israel. How'd you find Israel? Like grapes in the wilderness, I, I saw your fathers as the first fruit on the fig tree in its first season. But what happened? They went to Baal, Peor. They have worshipped at idols and separated themselves to that shame. They became an abomination like the things they love. The story of the fig tree is kind of like a sandwich. A sandwich, you got bread. You've got meat, you got bread. The top bread, Jesus curses the tree. He goes into the city on that Monday. Here comes the meat. And what does he do? He cleanses the temple because they were making a mockery out of worship. They were making a mockery out of God. That's the meat. And then here comes the bottom bread, application of the fig tree. You see, the fig tree is a parable enacted. It's a parable enacted. He is actually acting out 
a parable here. Here's my parable. We've got to have faith. We've got to have trust. We've got to believe in God. We can't be like the religious leaders in Jerusalem. It's also kind of a foreshadowing of the ultimate destruction of the temple. Remember, Jesus said, you know, he will say, every stone will be taken down. You know, these beautiful stones of the, of the temple, and they were beautiful. You know, Herod had built such a beautiful temple. You know, he had taken Zerubbabel's temple, and he had beautified it very much. You know, gold, white, marble. Oh, it was pretty. All of that gone. All of it gone. The only thing left is a few blocks of that retaining wall that held up the temple mount. That's all that's left of the whole temple mount construction. The stated lesson, though, is about faith and prayer. Effective prayer comes with what? Well, Matthew 21, 22. You've got to pray in faith. You've got to believe. It comes with obedience. 1 John 3, 22. It comes with persistence. Remember here in Luke 18, Jesus told that, that wonderful story of that persistent widow that, you know, she was not going to give up. She was not going to give up and she kept on until the judge finally granted her what she needed. So it's persistence. To have effective prayer, we also got to pray according to the Lord's holy will. John 14, 13 through 16. We've got to remain in Him. We've got to remain in Him. John 15, verse 7. We have to have cooperation with other believers, working together, and certainly we got to have unselfish motives. Is prayer powerful? Extremely powerful. Am I surprised when prayer is answered? No way, Jose. I expect an answer. What did Paul say? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. You know what? I can ask, I can ask God a whole lot. You know, I, I, there's a lot of things that I, need to, I want to ask God for. Do we sometimes not ask because we say, well, I don't want to embarrass God because I know He won't do it, you know? Are we kind of like, uh, you know, uh, maybe a child, maybe a, a teenager who, who's old enough to know and, and that teenager doesn't ask for this certain present because that teenager knows, well, my mom and dad can't afford it. I'm not going to embarrass them by, not, by asking them for it because I know they can't give it to me. So do we treat God the same way? Do we say, well, I'm not going to ask God for that because I know that's beyond capability. Lisa, you remember Phil Camp? Doctor said, Phil, call your family, notify them, you're going to be dead in six months. They were only off by about 18 years. Prayer. I give the credit to God. I think the very real danger for many Christians is not asking extravagantly, but we end up not asking at all. We fail to ask. Let's continue. Let's turn to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Verse 37. 
And in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple. But at night, he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet, the Mount of Olives. Then early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. What's amazing to me is we got the cross right on top of us. I mean, the cross is just days away. We're talking about Tuesday. He's going to be on the cross on Friday. You think about Tuesday, you've got Friday. What does Jesus do? He still is taking time to teach. That blows my mind. Now, yeah, the last two days have been good. They've been good for, for Jesus' popularity. We've had that, uh, that wonderful entry on Sunday. Uh, uh, we've got the temple cleansing on Monday. That certainly uh, pleased the common people. It didn't please the religious leaders, but it pleased the common people. The religious leaders must do something to discredit him. They must do something to stop him. So what do they do? Let's go to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Here in this part, we're going to see uh, representatives from all three major groups comprising the Sanhedrin. They're going to be there. We're going to have the chief priest. That's the Sadducees. That's the... Uh, uh, current high priest, the past high priest, and, and all the others uh, that were the up-and-coming uh, important priests. we got the chief priests, the Sadduceans. We've got the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, and then we got the elders. we got the uh, men of political, financial ability, and they're going to be there. And they're going to ask Jesus a question. The question is going to be, who gave you this authority? Who gave you the authority to do what you did in the temple on Monday? Who gave you the authority to run the money changers out and overturn their tables and, 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 and stop all the commercial business of the temple? Remember, Jerusalem really only had one employer. The employer was the temple. Most of the people who lived in Jerusalem, they had something to do with the temple. You know, they didn't, they didn't have factories. They, they weren't uh, uh, making pottery jars. Uh, uh, there's not fishing. Uh, uh, there's not anything like that going on in the city of Jerusalem. The main employment is the temple. So why did you do this? Now, Jesus is going to answer their question with a question. And you think, well, hold it, Jesus. You're just avoiding the subject. No, this was a way that it was very common in uh, rabbinical debates. It was very common to answer a question with one's own question. What are you doing? You're steering, you're steering the conversation the way that you need to steer it. So this was a very common way. If they had only answered truthfully, their answer would form the basis for Jesus' answer. But they don't. Let's look at what happens here. Mark chapter 11, verse 27. Then they came to Jerusalem. This is on Tuesday, best of our knowledge. And as he was walking in the temple, probably out there in the courtyard of the Gentiles, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? And then Jesus, as the greatest rabbi of all, the greatest teacher of all, he answered with a rabbinical question. I will also ask you one question. I'll ask you one question, then I'll answer yours. Then answer me. 
and I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. Boy, <laughs> if I was, uh, I was honored to be on several debate teams. And a couple times I got to be the head guy on the debate team. I would love to have Jesus on my debate team. If Jesus was on my debate team, I'd just sit back and say, you go ahead and handle it. I'll just watch you. Because Jesus was always in control. He was always the master of the situation. What's the question about John? Go back to Mark chapter 1 for just a moment. Mark chapter 1, verse 5. Notice what Mark reveals to us about the ministry of John. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. How was John looked upon by the masses? John was a folk hero, well accepted even by the Jews of Judea. See, Jesus, he's a hero to the Galilean Jews, but John, he was a hero to the Judean Jews. John was the first prophetic voice in approximately 400 years. And I can't remember the exact quote. I, I can't remember the exact quote, but from Star Wars, Obi-Wan Kenobi, when he's talking to Darth Vader, you know, strike me down, I'll come back even stronger. Something like that was the quote. That may be a little bit off. When John was martyred by Herod Antipas, that elevated his standing among the Judean Jews. Because the Judean Jews, except for the Herodians, did not like Herod Antipas. And you killed our only prophet. So John's popularity went even higher. John was popular. Jesus says, his baptism, where's it from? From heaven or from, from men? We got a problem here. We got a problem here. Go over to Luke chapter 7 for just a moment. Luke chapter 7, verse number 30. Luke 7, verse 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Speaking of John, we got a problem. How do we answer this question? They enter into a private discussion. And they talk among themselves. Matthew chapter 21. And they reason among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? Remember it said they were not baptized by John. They refused to believe in John. If we say from men, if we say John was nobody, if we say that John was just a guy, he's not a prophet, we fear the multitude. For all count, oh, they nailed it, they hit the hammer, they hit the nail with the hammer. All count John as a prophet. When John died at the hands of Herod, his popularity even went higher. So they answered Jesus and said, we do not know. <laughs> oh, you talk about a cop-out. 
You talk about a cop-out, they are copping out. They knew, but they're not going to say. So Jesus said to them, now Jesus didn't say, oh, I don't know. Notice what Jesus says. Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Their private discussion, their debate, betrayed the fact that they were in that catch-22 situation. Due to the leader's refusal to answer his question, Jesus responds with three very appropriate parables that are recorded by Matthew. The others don't record all three of them. Matthew records all three. All three have the same message. They're designed to show how the Jews, actually the Jewish leadership, had rejected God's authority in the past and now in the present with Jesus himself. Let's look at the parable of the two sons. Matthew chapter 21, verse 28. But what do you think? I love the way Jesus opens up. Okay, you, you don't, you're not going to answer my question, even though I know you know the answer. You know, I know that you know the answer. So what do you think? A man had two sons. Now, note this. In their culture, it was considered scandalous to speak back to one's father. You do not do that. The man had two sons. He came to the first son and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. I need you to work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. He was wrong. But then he regretted it, he repented and went and worked. He came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. <laughs> a lot of good talk, but not a lot of good walk here. Which of the two did the will of the Father? Okay, what's the answer? It's going to be embarrassing if they don't answer it. Because there's a crowd standing around probably, listening in, watching. And Jesus has already made mincemeat of the Jewish leaders, and now he's going in for the killer one. He's going in for that killer punch. They said to him, the first, Jesus said to them, uh, Surely I say to you, Jewish leaders, scribes, chief priests, Pharisees, elders of the people. I say to you that tax collectors and harlots, oh, hold it here, Jesus, the three worst ways to insult somebody in their culture was to call them a harlot, a tax collector, or a Samaritan. You can't find any better put-down words than those three words. Actually, four, because tax collector's two words, so make that four words. I, I stand corrected. I tell you that tax collectors and harlots enter into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. What's the theme of this parable? It's not those who talk the right talk, the Pharisees. Later on, Jesus will say, when he talks about the woes, he will do some woes, seven woes about the Pharisees and scribes. He will say, do as they say, but don't do as they do. They talked a good talk. Out of everybody there, besides Jesus, 
The Pharisees knew the old law the best. It's not those who talk the right talk that honor God, but those who walk the right walk. We would say it here in Arkansas, are you practicing what you preach? Are you practicing what you preach? Did they say that in Louisiana? Okay, that goes down to Louisiana too. So, you, are you practicing what you preach? The Pharisees did not. That's the reason why later on here, and we'll eventually get to it, Jesus will say, do as they say, but don't do as they do. Because they don't do it. They talk it, but don't do it. By the way, this is the first time that Jesus openly applies a parable to the religious leaders. Now, he had done it in the past, but it was always symbolic. A little bit, they had to kind of figure it out. Here it is plain. Jesus, I can almost see, as my mother would do, you know, did your mother ever point a finger at you? You know, you knew, hey, you're, 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 hey, that, it's you, it's you, you're guilty. I can almost see Jesus pointing a finger at them as he says this. They were making a mockery out of worship. Why would Jesus have to cleanse the temple? Not just once, but twice. Remember in John 2, he cleansed it at the beginning of his ministry. Why did Jesus have to do that? Because they were making a mockery out of worship. Can we do that today? What are the largest, quote, Church, or churches, one of the largest churches that I know of, just outside of Chicago, when they started that church, what did they do? They, they did a very extensive survey. They went into every door in the whole area, big community there. What do you want to see in a church? What do you want to see in a church? They didn't even talk about what did God want to see in his church. What did the Lord demand in his church? It was, what do you want to see in a church? Well, we'd like to have, you know, we we hate to have to leave and go to find a restaurant. We'd like to have, you know, maybe a, a food court. They put a food court in their building. Well, we'd like to have this, we'd like to have that, and, you know, uh, food court, entertainment, uh, this and that, and, you know, and that's what they did. It was not surprising that in just about a year and a half, they were already over 5,000 in attendance because it was what the people wanted. You see, when we leave God's Word... When we leave God's Word and just want to do what we want to do? Well, that's what I want it to do. What have we done? We have done exactly what the Jewish leadership was doing right here. They were doing things that they wanted. They wanted all that commercial business going on because that makes more money makes more money. Remember the picture I showed you of the reconstructed house that uh, they sometimes attributed to the high priest? That's a pretty fancy house. That's a pretty fancy place. You don't get that without having a lot of money. They made a hefty profit off of people. And remember when he cleansed the temple, he, he, he cast out those who were selling the doves? Why was the dove? The dove was a sacrifice that a poor person could do. You know, God had made allowances uh, for poor people. 
You know, people who were financially uh, uh, strained, they didn't have money. Well, you can, instead of sacrificing a, a bull or a, a goat or a lamb, you can just sacrifice a dove. That's more affordable. But they were even ripping off the poor people. They were ripping off the poor people and taking advantage of them. Now, let's look at the parable of the vineyard. We've got three parables here. The parable of the two sons. The parable of the vineyard is next. Verse number 33. In your Bible, it could be called the parable of the vine dressers or the parable of the tenants. All the same parable. Let's read it. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard. Now stop right there. Who would have been the landowners in their culture? Well, we do have some outsiders, non-Jews that owned land. That's right, the Romans, you know, they had come in, they had uh, taken land. Uh, the Greeks before they had taken land. But most of the landowners that Jesus was talking to here would have been the Sanhedrin. You don't get to be a member of the Sanhedrin if you're poor. You don't get to be a member of the Sanhedrin unless you are wealthy. So he's talking to people that very likely were landowners, that operated farms vineyards. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. Whoa here. This is not your common vineyard. This is a well-prepared, well-taken-care-of vineyard. He puts a hedge around it, a wall around it. He's got a, a, a watch tire there so they can watch for, uh, for enemies coming in and, and taking the harvest uh, and watching the, the, how the vineyard is doing. He even puts a wine press in the middle of the vineyard so they don't have to go somewhere to press the grapes. They've got it right there. This is a well-taken-care-of, well-prepared vineyard. What's the point here? On Wednesday night, we're going to talk more about this parable. We're almost out of time. In fact, let me check, make sure we don't have any questions. We don't. Wednesday night, we're going to talk about who is the landowner. Let me go ahead and tell you right now, who's the landowner in the story? It's God himself. What's this vineyard? It's Israel. It's the promises that God made to Israel. Who are the tenants? The people that God had entrusted with, with his promises, had entrusted with, with his land, with Israel, with his children, that would be the religious leaders. Who's going to be the servants? It's going to be the prophets that God had sent to Israel. And who's going to be the son? Well, you know that. That's Jesus himself. And I love how Jesus handles this. Because as we'll look at Wednesday night, Lord willing, he's going to ask... What will he do to those wicked vine dressers? And their answer is really about them. We'll look at that come Wednesday night. As I said, we're going to continue the final week. Uh, we've got several more lessons to do. If you don't have one of these lessons, come up here and get them. Uh, we're going to have not quite 200 stories in the greatest stories and events of the Bible. That will take us through Acts. Then I've got a big surprise. I've got a, Pam, you're going to love it. We're going to have a very, very, very interesting study after that. And then we're going to start the book of Revelation as a sermon series, if I can survive. 
that. We're going to do it starting next or starting on the 25th of uh, this month. So that is our schedule. I'm supposed to end at 940. It is 939. I'm going to end a minute early. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.